And we're back with our third speaker of today's conference. After Holger, we're actually going to have a longer break. But now I'm very excited to introduce my good friend and business partner as well, Holger Niels Pohl. Holger and I go way back uh, a few years ago. I wanted to learn um, visualization and I had a workshop running. And then during the break, I saw someone else having a workshop that was a visualization workshop. So I just jumped in, like interrupting his workshop. I'm like, do you give classes? And he was like, yeah, here's my number. And then we connected from then onwards. Um, in the past years, we've done so much work together. And I, every time I enjoy working with Holger, because not only is he super professional, but also a great person, a great, great friend. And I'm more than happy to introduce you here, Holger. Um, the stage is yours. Ah, thank you, Sora. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm very pleased to be here. It's very amazing, to be honest. Uh, I was part of this, uh, this journey with you from the beginning, actually, because I did some of the graphic recordings of the early uh, 100 conferences. And I'm pretty happy that I can talk now at this stage with you. So welcome, everybody. Um, it would be super interesting for me uh, to see where you are from right now. We have roughly 200 people online. So perhaps just type in the chat where you're dialing in from and perhaps your day time that will be interesting as well right now. I'm dialing in from Cologne uh, here in my home office still. Uh, in Germany, we opened up a bit, but it's still home office. And I want to talk to you about a new framework, um, how to create clarity and therefore succeed in your business, especially in the agile world and building everything together that you heard today or um, in the past at our conferences. So I see there is a Leise in Copenhagen, Denmark. We have Aachen, a lot of people from Aachen and Slovakia, Cologne, uh, Pune, India. That's great. Leipzig, Berlin from Yorkshire, Yorkshire, England, wonderful Mexico City. So we're spreading around the whole world. Um, that is wonderful. So thank you for that. Um, perhaps we do one thing. I'm not sure uh, if you stood up after this break or if you kept sitting at the chair on your computer. So perhaps you do a quick exercise with me together. I prepared myself, but I want to get into the ease of presentation. I want to help you too. So I want to measure our room. So perhaps we do that exercise. I can't see you here. Normally we can see videos, but this is a form where, where we can't. But perhaps you stand up and measure your room with your feet. I will do the same for me. So I walk through my room and measure the steps that I have to take to just cross my room. And perhaps you write in the chat as well how big your room is, how many steps did you need, like normal steps, how far ever you step. So go ahead, uh, go stand up and measure your room now with the steps. How many steps do you need to cross? I will do the same for me. Okay, so there we have six, eight steps for me and Afak, five steps. For me, it's eight steps. Chris, that's small, three steps, to be honest. Adam, three as well. I see a nine from Marcus Reinke. So, oh, Sarah has 14. That's definitely top here. Sarah Hillman and Andreas, 10. It's not bad, too. So the smallest was three, the, the largest was 14 steps. So that's wonderful. Thank you for doing that exercise uh, with me here. It always helps to get a bit of the blood flowing. So what I want to talk to you about today is how like, do we deal with all that uncertainty that we're living in, not through like just because of the pandemic, but before as well. And you heard Tendai and Jürgen sp speak about um, techniques, how to innovate and create new stuff. And I want to help you understand how you can take that perhaps even a bit more into practice. But first, let me start with the diagram that I learned from Stacy. Um, and some of you might be very familiar with that diagram. So hopefully that works out. I'm not sure if you see that um, mirrored or correctly. Perhaps you could help me store up if you can see that in the right way or the wrong way. So hopefully you can see that in the wrong way, in the right way. So when we- Right um, way, it's, it's the right way. It's the right way, thank you, one. wonderful. So when we draw these two axes and, and we think about uncertainty, right? Um, what kind of uncertainty are we dealing with? There is one level of uncertainty that we call the what uncertainty, where we are not very clear about what we need to do to solve a given problem or to act in a project. And then there is a how uncertainty, where we don't actually know um, 
how we should approach this problem or running that project. But let me explain that a bit more in depth for you, what that means. And a lot of people don't know, but I am a trained carpenter. Before I studied communication design and got to facilitation coaching, I became a carpenter. And let, let's take this example. And let's say you come to me and say like, Holger, we bought a new house and we want to have a dining table for that new house. And the dining table should be out of oak and wood. Uh, it should be that and that size. And we have actually an idea for the design too. So yeah, to be honest, when you look at this graph, um, yeah, it is not very high uncertainty for me in terms of how or what I should do here, but it's pretty simple for me to create that table, right? Pretty simple. But when you come to me and say, like, Holger, we bought a new house, we want to have a dining table, and hmm, we don't know yet which kind of wood we would like to have. We don't know about the design. We are pretty sure that we want to fit like hmm, five to 10 people. That is a bit more complicated, right? Complicated uh, because I need to ask se like separate questions to understand how to deal with that. But you could imagine that still for me as a trained carpenter, the way forward to reduce uncertainty, to really know what I need to do and how I want to do it is pretty easy still. Then there is a domain that we, I mean, we hopefully not get in there too often anymore, which is total chaos, right? I would say when the pandemic hit the fence here, um, we were in chaos, but normally in the, in the world that we're living in right now, we are somewhat in the complex domain. And when we are in the complex domain and say like, let's say we are starting with our project, our problem is somewhere here. What, what could that problem be in our case? You come to me and say like, Holger, I will buy a new house. I'm not sure what kind of house I will buy. And I want something to, um, yeah, it's a Stacey metrics, Alexander, by the way. So we want to have something to eat at. Um, we don't know yet if we want to stand, to sit, uh, to, to kind of lie on the floor when we eat. We don't know which kind of room we want to eat. We don't know how, much, how, many, how many people. The material is not clear yet. It does like, we're not sure yet about the design. We're not sure what we will eat. That is very complex for me because I actually don't know how I can ask myself through that right away to be straight in terms of how can I build this table and what need I, do I need to do for building that table? So the approach of Agile, and this is very known to a lot of you, but perhaps I thought for some of you, um, it might be not that familiar. Uh, you navigate that field uh, through complexity back and forth. It's not a straight path. It's, it's kind of small steps. Sometimes you're going to the right direction. Sometimes you're going in the wrong direction. But as long as you're making small steps and pretty, pretty fast experiments, you're hopefully coming to that goal that you're achieving and into the area and domain of more complicated and then the questions get easier. So here you need to act in an agile way. But agile is not enough for me. Uh, agile would be nice because like you need to make the small increments and we talked about the iterations and all that kind of stuff before, but as well, you need to communicate because let's imagine you're sitting at this place right now and you're not sure in which way you need to navigate. You need it to have a community of people. So this is one friend of yours or colleague. Here's another friend of yours. Here's another friend or colleague of yours. What you need to do in that case is you need to triangulate yourself like a smartphone and see where am I at the moment on my path? And can I, can I learn from the experience and the knowledge of others to actually make that happen and, and wandering into the right direction? And this is why it becomes so critical for us to communicate in the right way. Hopefully you see that and it becomes more and more important that we can talk about what we are managing here. The thing is, what do we actually manage here? And those things that we manage are, I call them wicked problems. It's a bit of a scientific phrase, to be honest, but um, I like it. And let me explain to you what a wicked problem actually is. Okay, so let's get rid of some pens here. So let's imagine you want to solve a problem that is wicked. So the definition of a wicked problem, first of all, is that you not only have one element that comes with a wicked problem, you have perhaps two elements of different shapes or three elements or four or five. Oh, there is another one. Oh, there is another one. 
and they all have different shapes and sizes. So while you're trying to discover the problem, understanding the problem, what you're working with, right? You figure that there are a lot of things happening while you try to understand the problem. But the definition of wicked problems goes even further, which is a bit bad, to be honest, because it's not only about the different elements, but while you're working on the different elements, they are shaping, like they are sh changing the shape constantly. And they kind of combining which is, which, with each other. And when you try to solve this one here, another one might change the shape, right? Everything is in constant movement and change. But if that's not enough, right? If that is not enough, that comes another problem that will, will, will be even more challenging because uh, to solve the wicked problem. That is, out of those elements that the problem contains, there might be different solutions for a wicked problem. It could look like this, the first solution that we have. Another solution could look like this. And another solution could look like this. So what I'm saying here is um, that if you have a wicked problem, there are a lot of different pieces coming together. The pieces are changing while we try to solve the problem. This is something you know from Agile and trying to work Agile. And while you're trying to solve the problem and with all the moving parts and the people who are involved, even the solutions are not defined as this is the solution or this is the solution. All three solutions here are possible solutions for the wicked problems because you never can solve them completely, right? In their, in their whole uh, being, so to say. So how can we actually solve a wicked problem? That's a big question for today, of course. And um, we, can, we can look at this here, at this situation. So uh, sorry for the kind of the low tech one, but I hope that you enjoy that anyway. I need to work on the lighting too as well. But when you see that situation where, let's say this is you, right? This is you, or this is perhaps me as well. And I have all the bits and pieces of the problem, of the wicked problem in my head. What is happening to my colleagues, right? What is happening to them? I mean, that's kind of a rhetorical question. They don't have a clue, right? They don't know what the problem looks like. They don't know what I'm thinking, right? Nobody can look into my brain. I, even as I know Zorap and Tendai for a long time, I mean, I don't know what they are thinking, right? I never know what Zorab is thinking anyway. So, but that's another story. We have always good conversations. But when I start putting it down on like all the different pieces that I have in mind and I put them down on a flip chart, what happens here is that my colleagues, my friends, they can start interact with my thoughts because I externalize my thoughts onto something else and I make it. I make it possible that they can interact with my thoughts, which is pretty powerful. Let's take that speech bubble away. Let's move the thoughts a bit over here uh, so that they fit together nicely. Let's move them here a bit. So what happens is that they can actually, by making their own thoughts, thoughts visible, they can actually add their thoughts and their insights of the problem. And the wicked problem is having two things, two elements. So the one thing are the informations, right? The information, the content, the different elements of the problem. But then even more important, this is something you can only do if you externalize your thoughts, if you start creating a shared understanding of the problem. The only thing that you can then do, or that, that's what you can do then actually is, you build the connections, right? Not the perfect connections. sometimes they're not perfect fitting together, but, um, you're building the connections to understand the problem better. And that's what you do to solve wicked problems. You externalize your thoughts, you map down all the different elements, some people call them notes, and then you connect them with each other and understanding like how they fit together. And that is systems thinking. That is the core of system thinking. And that's what we need to achieve to get better in problem solving and in, in, in kind of solving wicked problems, right? So that's kind of the starter, setting the scene, hopefully helping you as well to understand a bit better on like, how could we approach this actually, right? So now that we understood together what like the definition of wicked problems and how we actually can solve them, let me put that away so I have more space for the rest of the talk here. And we're looking into 
and you get a sense of this, why are visuals so powerful to help you doing that? And especially visual tools. So let me grab my iPad for a second, getting the technology ready for sharing, which is hopefully uh, working well and not like screwing up the technology now. Let's see this screen. So the one thing that I think is so powerful, and hopefully you can see now the word focus, or if you could give me an indication that works now. So um, you it does. create, thank you, Sora, you create focus. Let me tell you a quick story on focus and how focus work, works with visual tools, right? So imagine I am that gray guy here on the left, right? I'm the gray guy on the left. I'm taking the bad role here. And you are the girl on the right side, right? So Rob, you can imagine being that girl now. And I'm trying to explain you a great business idea. Like Jürgen said with the Vortex and Tendai with the tools and stuff. No, I just talk to you about the idea. Or we stand in a retrospective or a review and I don't show you something, but I just tell you what is in my mind. What's happening to you is, of course, you are a good colleague and perhaps a friend and you're listening carefully. And you try to follow my threat. Like, yeah, he's saying this and he's saying that. And of course, I'm understanding that. And perhaps, let's, let's back up for a second. Perhaps in that moment, I say something about like, look, this is even better than a checklist. And then you think like, hmm, a checklist? What about my grocery shopping list? What did we want to eat tonight? Hmm, we did want to have pasta, I think. That was a nice wine we had last time. Did I have that wine? Where did I get that wine? Actually, I need to carry, I need to Google that again. What happens is the train of thoughts get lost. You get lost in focus and you don't follow my thoughts anymore and we don't create alignment together. How can we actually overcome that problem? And we can overcome that by putting a tool in the center of our conversation, a visual tool. In this case, I just take this in, as an example. It's just a placeholder. You could put any visual tool here. I put the business model canvas because a lot of people know that. And I work a lot with Endai and Alex and I'm in that field of business model innovation. But if we put that tool in, in, into the center of, of our conversation, what happens is I can relate to that tool and I can tell you like, yeah, this is what I'm actually want to like, let me just repeat that here. This is what I actually want to tell you. And this is our business idea with the channels and the customer segments and value proposition and the key resources we need and this and that and that. What happens to you, your mind? We are very visual as people, right? As, as human beings. What happens is all your thoughts are focused on the business model canvas, on the visual tool. And that's why I think it is so crucial that we put visual tools in the center of what we do, especially when we are in an agile world, especially because you're dealing with complex topics, you're dealing with wicked problems, and you need to kind of over communicate what you're doing with your teams, right? With your teams, with the people you are reporting to, with whomever you want to collaborate, over communicating clarity is the thing to be successful. And you do that with visual tools, right? And, and that's why I think it is so important to, to put the tools into the center, right? So let's look at that from, from another angle now and say like, now that we understood that actually that is a, a, it's a good thing to kind of use visual tools, um, of course, drawing is one of the tools, but we don't focus too much on drawing today, right? Not too much on drawing today. Do you see the slides uh, sort of well? And do you still, still see me as well? Hopefully. Yes, I do. Um, good, wonderful. So Dario Fo, I like that quote, uh, while drawing and discover what I really want to say. And um, yeah, that's true for me too. So sometimes I just need a pen and a paper. And, and when I say draw something, I just write something down. Remember how we solve wicked problems. We, we map out the different elements and we draw connections to them, right? That's all. Perhaps you just make a mind map or you just draw an affinity map or something. However, but the one thing is that a lot of successful people embrace this. And I have some of the successful people from the past or living as well, uh, took my joke here in, in, in this as well, but like all those people, what do they have in common, right? What do they have in common? They are all famous visual thinkers. 
So some people might know Sarah Hadid passed away a few years back, sadly enough. But she was a famous visual thinker and architect who heavily relied on sketches for conversations, right? And then everybody knows Charles Darwin, and he is known for using conceptual sketches to develop his theory of evolution. We have Leonardo da Vinci, who discovered things in his sketches that he didn't know he knew, which is a nice thing. So I don't want to say that I am Leonardo da Vinci, actually, but perhaps it happens to you as well. Sometimes you you write something down, a concept or something, you're thinking about a problem or a project that you're working on and you're writing something down or even sketching something. So if you sketch something, you, you could even write in the chat that you're already sketching, that would be nice. Um, but sometimes I draw something and all of a sudden I see that the drawing doesn't work because I missed the connection and I see that connection in my drawing and then I think like, yeah, I knew that before somehow. And it showed me that I didn't know what I know. Right. Then Alexander Osterwalder, you met him in the, I think it was the very first Agile 100 conference, right, Zorab? It's, uh, it's been, uh, yeah. Yes. Yes, it's been a while that I'm working with him. And if you meet him, he uses very rough sketches, not very nice sketches. But um, every time he explains the concept, he grabs a pen and explains that too. And then Sigmund Freund uh, relied on sketches as well to develop his theory, right? Not a lot of people know that, but he sketched them out. So it's an interesting just just having some people here to give you like the the uh, motivation and the allowance actually to take sometimes a pen and sketch something just for your brain. Nobody has to see them actually. But sometimes it's helpful if somebody sees them too. And of course, it's about you to get more visual as well. I can't fulfill this task to this completely tonight, uh, today because we only have a few minutes here together. But I just want to give you another framework. And it's not a big framework, don't fear. It's a small framework, it's an easy framework that can help you implement more of this. Not only drawing, because drawing is just one tool, it's a small tool, it's a very powerful tool, but it's not the tool that you use, you use for everything. But it's a, it's a very handy tool. But there are a lot of different other visual tools. When it comes to the bottom line here, what we try is working better together, isn't it? In the Agile community, when you're using Scrum, the Safe, whatever you use, the Vortex, we heard like Tendai talking about the, the intrapreneurs. It's all about how can we work better together. And I think when you embrace the thinking of visual tools as a complementary set of skills that you have, if you master them uh, right. And I, re I just remind yourself, the business model canvas is a visual tool, right? The value proposition canvas is a visual tool. Uh, a journey map is a visual tool and drawing might be a visual tool. And I think they are like superchargers for your methodology that you're using at the moment. Um, let me explain that. If you see Scrum, for example, it's one of the methodologies a lot of people use, right? A lot of you use actually. And I think visual tools can really boost that space rocket. So it gets faster, it gets far away. The same goes for business model innovation or facilitation or let's take design thinking or uh, agile in general. Another one is Lean Start. We heard about that from Jurgen today as well. Or coaching or presentations. Everything is getting better when you're using visuals, I guess. I mean, I'm, I'm a bit biased to be honest. Uh, and you, you hear that I'm quite fascinated on that topic, but I think everything is better. It's kind of your supercharger that you could use. And then when you see that this could supercharge your practice, I think another one that is very crucial, especially for the agile environment is that with visual tools, you create a star chart, which is clarity. When you map down the things that you're working on and in the reviews and the retrospective, always making it visual and really mapping it out in a, in a great way, using visual tools to, to their best abilities, then you can always have your vision in mind and know like, this is where, where we want to get. And vision can be actually understand like the vision in Scrum if you want to. Always having in mind, what is the vision that we want to achieve? Where are we right now with our space rocket? And then how do we get there, right? This is, in essence, what you can do with the visual tools. And therefore, it's not enough for me that you have this mindset of, yeah, I need to have the mindset of visual tools. I think it's necessary that you ingrain this into your DNA um, 
and it's really part of your daily life. Every, every time you think about something, you grab sticky notes or a tool that, you, that can help you clarify this. And sticky notes in the best sense, right? So then I uh, talked about the sticky note uh, theater, innovation theater and stuff, right? That's not the way, but sticky notes are powerful in a certain process uh, of your project. So to help you implement that better, to help you getting an understanding of how is my project looking like and when should I use which kind of tool, I found that there is a very simple framework that is underlying all the other methodologies, all the other frameworks that we know. And it's so simple that I sometimes thought it's, it's silly to name it, but once I started using it with, for myself and with my clients a few years, years back, I saw huge differences in projects. And this is how it is, very simple. Every project and every problem solving thing starts with understanding what you want to solve. And as you know, we spend way too less time here. We always jump into how can we create something? But first, we want to understand what is lying in front of us. Think of the wicked problems. How does do the things together, like fit together? The second thing is we create something. This might be an increment, a product increment in Scrum. This might be a prototype for testing a business model. Um, this might be a prototype that comes out of design thinking. This might be a presentation, whatever it is. Could be just developing ideas. And the third step is sharing because everything we do is about sharing, yeah? It's like we want to share with the world. We want to have the buy-in of our management. We want to have a venture capital to invest in our ideas. We have our stakeholders who needs to review what we've done. So we need to share this. And once we shared this, of course, it's kind of looping back because we learn from this. We capture the learnings in the right way and we adapt. We gain a new level of understanding. We do a new round and we're getting better and better and better. Let me take this, uh, let me think about like what kind of visual tools that we have today that we could sort into this, into this framework. So Tendai talked about the business model canvas briefly and I think Jürgen as well. And the business model canvas is about understanding um, how your as a business model looks like, designing new business models, and sharing those ideas with others. Then we have this beautiful two, like two by two metrics from Tendai about mapping the innovation programs. Do you remember? Where you understand how does it fit to growth and all that kind of stuff. And then uh, Jürgen talked about the value proposition canvas as well. Um, with the value map, which is about your value proposition per se, and the customer profile, which is about the pains and gains and customer jobs to be done. And then last but not least, you're like, I'm sorry, you're in, it's, a, it's a very rough draft of your vortex, but uh, I couldn't do it quicker because it was just 10 minutes before my, before my, my take here, but we had that. So let's, let's see how I would sort that. I would say, we have a lot of understanding tools here because the two by two metrics was about understanding what kind of programs we have to be able to act on this and design something new. We have the customer profile, which is all about understanding our customer, not designing our customer, understanding our customer. And the vortex as well as, as I understood, Jürgen is more a tool of understanding where are we in the process and therefore then taking the next steps of action or filling the gaps that we see in our project. The value map from the value proposition canvas, therefore, is more a creation tool as well, where you create your value proposition based on your understanding for your customer. And in the middle, as a kind of so-called visual inquiry tool, we have the business model canvas because the business model canvas can actually be used for everything. Could be used for understanding, could be used for creating, could be used for sharing, right? Hopefully that makes sense to you. Um, and what I do is I try to sort those things. And the most important thing that you need to take away is that you have in mind in my project, in which kind of phase am I right now? Do I need to understand, create, or share? If I present or prepare something for sharing, it looks definitely different than when I use it for creating. Just giving you an example of the sticky notes in the brainstorming session of design thinking should be not the ones that you present in a sharing session because in a sharing session, you should have created something beautiful or something powerful as a prototype that you can share your ideas with. 
Okay, so let's take an experiment here together. And Sarab, you need to help me then out with the chat. So what yeah, you see here is very complex, but let's focus just on the left part here. So brainstorming, interviews, journey map, customer profile, and an empathy map. Where would you participate, right? Write that in the chat. Write the number of the tool plus uh, the characters. Where would you place the tools? I give you an example. Brainstorming number one would definitely be a creation tool for me. So it would be 1B. So just test that for, for one, two, three, four, and five. Write down where would you put that into the Clarity Framework? Where would you put the tools? How would you use them? Write that in the chat. And I'm waiting for Zorab's uh, feedback, what people are writing in here, and getting something to drink in the meantime. Okay, Holger, you there? Uh huh. So we're getting one A, five A, A two, or C ten. All like right. Drawing, yeah. Yeah. Two A. So do you want me also? That only give the yeah, numbers. No, that's or... good. So that's wonderful. So yes, I think the one can go for it. brainstorming can go as well for understanding how I would do it. Is this right? So for me. The journey mapping is a tool for either understanding or creating something new for our customer, right? The brainstorming is for me a creation tool. Interviews are understanding as well as the customer profile and the empathy map are understanding tool, aren't they? So when we take that for the other tools, prioritization, the two by two metrics is kind of universal, but visual templates most likely are for sharing often, sometimes for working as well. On camera shows like we have today, it's a sharing tool, right? Don't underestimate the power of a good presentation. And landing pages are definitely a sharing tool where you test your prototype. Or when you then see, for example, drawing, I put that in the middle because drawing for me is definitely something that you can use for all the faces. But for example, a storyboard is something that you create for sharing it later on. Or visual prototypes, for example, definitely aiming for the sharing phase. So, Hopefully that makes sense for you to, to get a bit more of a feeling of where can we put visual tools in the process while we try to solve wicked problems. And I try to keep that as simple as possible as a framework, right? So when you see that the three steps are kind of departed and three others, but if you if you just remember I understand create share, that would be enough. What you normally do is you explore the problem first with a lot of sticky notes and stuff and tools. You connect the dots. That's what I talked about how to approach wicked problems, then you frame the problem, you create something like a problem statement, which you use to create and ideate uh, a lot, create a lot of ideas, then focusing your efforts, you know that from design thinking, making it tangible, building prototypes of presentation and stuff, going over and preparing the story flow, like I prepared, for example, the story flow for today, and hopefully you like it, and presenting like a pro, I think everybody can learn all the time on that one, and then capturing the learnings to get that loop back. And that's basically it for every project that you embark on. You can use different methods if you want to, and you can use design thinking and Scrum and, and business model innovation and everything, right? I don't say that this is exchanging the existing methodologies. It's just an underlying, like a, like transparent underlying framework that can help you orientate in the process either in, in a one-day workshop where you run through all the phases or the whole project that you are embarking on. And of course, I think it's powerful if you can uh, actually draw something uh, while, you, while you're doing it, right? It's always good because it's faster and it less, leaves less, less room for lies. So that's what I'm working on right now. And uh, Sora, perhaps do I have like three more minutes uh, to finish up, and then we go and yes, the Q &A absolutely, absolutely, no okay, worries. Cool. No. So when we talk, like, let me just say something about the drawing again, because we talk about the visual tools, and everybody is sometimes about drawing. When I talk about drawing, I'm, I'm talking about this level of drawing in most cases when it comes to understanding and creating. 
when it comes to sharing, you might want to be a bit more refined. But if it's about understanding and creating, we talk about this level of drawing skills. Um, and as well, these kind of drawing skills, right? It's messy. Like an, a wicked problem is messy. Uh, my drawing, this is one of my drawings as well. It's messy because I tried to understand something with somebody else. Or if you see this, uh, I, my, that's kind of four years ago or something when I worked with Alex Osterwalder on the Clarity Framework. And uh, what I did is I, I drew the gray elements on the paper. I took a photo, took an iPad to our dinner uh, meeting, and then we drew over it. This is kind of a real example. It's not a fake. Uh, I don't know what we said there in that kind of what we did in that meeting. I don't, I can't make any sense of that anymore, but it doesn't matter because it really helped us communicate with each other better, exchanging our ideas, mapping our thoughts onto that paper or onto that iPad and helping therefore a, a better level of, of creation, right? And that's what, what I say in terms of when I'm speaking about um, drawing, don't estimate that I'm always talking about the high refined drawings, right? That's important. Especially because now I want to share with you one last uh, story before I close. And this is, uh, I, I guess, pretty refined drawing, so don't uh, get demotivated by that one too. Um, before we, I close with a very short story, I just want to uh, say that I'm working on the Creating Clarity book. And I'm pretty amazed because at the moment, my beta readers are sending me the feedback on the second draft. So it's close to being finished. I need to refine and build in all that feedback and then sending it to the editor. But hopefully it will get published or launched in November, in this November. So if you want to stay tuned, um, I'm really looking forward to having that in, in life because I worked for it on that, I think for five years now or so. Uh, it will ingrain a lot of different visual tools that you could use as well as the whole framework that I just talked about to you. And to close that with, with a story, hopefully a motivational one, and let me just make that bigger now again. So you should see habits and routines. Uh, so if you, if you see that, you could give me a quick go. Um, yes, I do. Great. Good, thank you. So I think a lot of you, are already very like experienced, right? When you're working um, within, within the Agile environment and Scrum and all the years. But still, when you're seeing this, this approach of using visual tools to solve wicked problems, perhaps that's something you need to embrace as well as a new thing or need to refocus on that because you didn't focus too much on that. And therefore, you need to change your habits and routines. Or if you want to implement Scrum or the the innovation ideas or entrepreneur ideas by Tendai. Um, when you want to do that, you need to change um, your routines and habits. But what are routines and habits actually? When we're thinking about that, I think about that everybody has the package to carry, right? That's you, that's me. Um, and that package is actually in our head. It's a psychological uh, package that we carry with all our habits, routines, the things, how we react to others, and to request and all that kind of stuff, how we do our projects. How does that start? Actually, it starts already as a toddler because our parents are kind of start to shaping our habits and routines and we go into kindergarten perhaps or to school, middle school, wherever, university, right? All those things are shaping our, our mindset, our routines, our habits, as well not to forget our friends at a beer in the bar, our best half perhaps, uh, they all shape how we act and how we feel and what we do. So what happens basically in a, in a real sense is that our brain gets shaped over time. Different neurons and are connected to each other and building pathways in our brain with these routines and habits. And you can think of those routines and habits like a, like a highway, like a four-way highway in your brain. It's pretty fast, right? Like everything is going, you don't have to think about it. But now when you're thinking about implementing agile, visual tools, new innovation metrics, all that kind of stuff, it might feel like this guy in front of the jungle. Why right? this small guy in front of the jungle? Because you need to build a new trail in your head, literally in your head. You need to build new connections. And it is not easy, right? So you, you go to the jungle and you fight your way through and the trail is pretty, pretty like, small it's not easy to navigate there and like there might be animals and stuff so it's, it's a bit scary sometimes and 
give you the permission to sometimes say like, ah, I don't care. I just get away of that tool. I'm, I'm getting back to my highway. I just do it the old way, not agile, not scrum, not visual. I'm just doing it the old way. But I bet, and this is a problem when you joined Zorop's Agile 100 here and other courses, uh, I bet that you now know that if you stay with the old way, it's like a theater coulisse, right? It's like this thing that people made up for a movie. And it looks pretty nice, right? Your project might be okay, right? You might be doing well and execution is okay, but now you know it could be better. If you implement the agile way, the visual way, whatever you learn, it's the real thing that you get. And it's a bit unfair that you learn all this because now you know you need to thrive for the real thing, I guess. And I want to just invite you to keep on it. It's not easy to change the way you do. It's not easy to change for yourself. It's not easy for an organization. The old highways will always be there. The old habits and routines will stay, perhaps with a bit less street, less, less fast, but they will stay. And everything you will learn over time, and I want to, you to embrace that. Everything that you learn over time will be a new journey. Perhaps this time, not the jungle, but there might be a travel through the Sahara or the Arctic or whatever. But if you keep learning, you will keep having those journeys. It's not easy, but I think it's worthwhile trying. So thank you for having the opportunity talking to you today. Uh, I'm done, Sora. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you so much, Holger. If you don't mind unsharing your presentation so that people can yes. see the two of us larger uh, engaging in the conversation. <clears throat> so first of all, Holger, again, thanks so much. And if you have monitored the chat, which I think you did not do, that was what I wanted to do for you. A lot of people have been asking about the tools and techniques that you use for this visualization. Before yes. we d j go to the content that you actually covered, can you give a, a like in a, in a few sentences, how did you set this all up? Okay. so. When I have, perhaps I show that, and the, uh, the best way is I show that quickly on a, on a sketch because I can't show you right away with the camera, but I can sketch it very quickly with, for you, okay? So let me just put that down here so you see my paper well. Yes. So imagine when we see that from the, like, from, uh, the side first. So let me draw that from the side first. What I have here is a, a so-called document camera, and a document camera is uh, looking like this. It has a few angles that you can you can use it for, and it's a it's a USB camera. So it's a, with a USB in my in my Mac. So I can actually have what I do now, my paper, for example, lying here. You see what I'm drawing, or I could have the same camera with a different angle. For example, like like this here, and then therefore showing me right here. So I'm looking in that camera. So that's, that's the first thing that I have. It's one of the most important tools. Um, it's, if you Google document, document camera, for example, or tabletop camera, or I'm using the model Epevo Ziggy Cam, uh, then you can find that. I think that's one of the most important tools in your toolbox in terms of uh, sharing something very quickly um, to uh, to your audience. What I have as well as a setup is that I have my MacBook here. So I have MacBook standing here. Let me quickly draw that here, very rough. So here's my MacBook. And then I have as well an iPad here. So I have an iPad. It doesn't have any, any buttons anymore, but that's my iPad, right? So what I have now as a setup is my USB cable from that camera. That USB cable is plugged in here. Um, and then my MacBook has a Wi-Fi connection with my iPad, OK? So what I'm doing is when I'm showing things on my iPad, I'm using on the, on the Mac, I'm using a um, a software called Air Server it has this kind of logo. And the Air Server allows me that I can stream the content from my iPad to my MacBook 
and my MacBook is actually showing you the screen, right? And that's what I'm doing. Is that is that clear so far in terms of technology? Yeah, yeah that's clear. And when I'm using the iPad, I'm for drawing. I think that's one of the questions. Uh, I'm using the app Procreate. And uh, Sorab, um, I I understood that you will share um, the slides and stuff. Yes. Uh, can you as well share a Dropbox link? Is that possible? Yes, absolutely. Okay, because what I can so whatever, offer you- Whatever you send me, I can share it with the participants. Yeah, perfect. Because then I can offer you as participants, I can send you a folder that is called Procreate, and it will contain my own brushes, my custom brushes, my colors, my default um, picture, my default canvas, um, and, and a one and a half hour webinar where I explain how I use Procreate to draw like a draw. And it, uh, you can just have that as part of the package here. So you will get a Dropbox link and then you can install everything on your iPad if you want to. Perfect, perfect. So a lot of the things then coming. Now let's go into the content. Yes. Um, you and I have talked about your framework, the Clarity framework, understand, create and share uh, several times. Now we saw Jürgen talking earlier about um, several of the other frameworks that you can use to get to new ideas or implement new ideas. Yes. And one particular part of uh, the Lean Startup that Jürgen pointed out that he enjoys and most of the other frameworks probably do not include or do not emphasize on so much is the learning part. Right? Yes. We have built, measure, learn that's very specific, but um, where, do you, where do you put that learning part, which is the key to agility for me in your understand, create and share framework? Yeah, it's kind of the last arrow between share and understand. Because when you remember the under, like the clarity framework, it's a cycle, right, as well. And when you understood your problem or try to understand elements of it and you create kind of an increment or an, uh, like a prototype and you share the prototype with somebody else or the story, then you always need to loop back into a new level of understanding by capturing the learnings. And then you use different uh, methodologies to capture those learnings it might be a retrospective, it might be the bonus thinking hats, might be SWOT, it might be whatever you want to use, right? Um, there, that's where I see it, like at the bottom, the arrow back between share and understand. And understand. And, and okay, of, it's very important. Okay. Now you put out a lot of the other tools out there, like being the business model canvas, value proposition design, etc. Now, what I when I look at the Clarity framework, for me, it becomes some kind of a meta framework, right? It gives you the ability to use a lot of the other tools for the individual sections. Now, yes. um, some people were writing that several of the tools can be used for several of the, several of the steps in the Clarity yes. Framework. Can you give an example of a tool that you could use for both understand, create, and for share? Yes. Um, let me take uh, another one. Then, like we have the business model canvas, right? That is that is a pretty clear uh, tool uh, for that, but. Um, so what might people know? So the classical two by two matrix, let's, let's take a very simple one, right? If you, two, if you use a classic two by two matrix, you can use that for mapping out existing things like the SWOT matrix, for example, um, that would be understand. You could use that as well to shape ideas and prioritizing, for example, ideas in the creation phase and see what do we have? What are we missing? How do we want to continue with that? And you could use, this matrix as well to show others what you worked on and how things are related to each other. So two by two is a very flexible thing, for example, that you can use in all of the of the elements. And that's important, Zorab, as a question. It's not a scientific framework. It's an it's kind of an empirical framework too, right? So we're not talking about the science of is it an understanding tool, is it a creation tool? We're talking about the science of we want to use a visual tool, let's just think twice that we're not using the completely wrong tool for the task that we have in hand. And therefore, in the in the upcoming book, I created as well an assessment, and Tender was part of that process too, by the way, um, and Alex, um, and have an assessment where you can actually have a good conversation with the team and say like, look, we have, like somebody proposed this tool to us, is that actually the right tool that we should use? And that's something I, I try to help people understand is, just because there is a new tool, is it really worth it using in your process? And you can new have a process, yeah, in your organization. 
So yeah. final question, when is your book coming up? The book is hopefully coming up in November. If you want to, um, if you want to be uh, super sure that um, you get like the information that it is online, that is launched, I invite you to get to sign up to my newsletter. I will post that in the chat now. Perfect. So yeah, I was there's gonna a ask you this. Um, so sign up there. It's it's not a selling newsletter. You, it's a lot of added value. Even you get a new template and um, like a design sprint roadmap if you want to. If you sign up and uh, explanation on how to use them, and I really try to share a lot on that newsletter. Is my my direct connection to my peers and people. So just go there and you get the information first when it's launched here, right? So that's the same one where you also share a lot of visualization tips and tricks, right? Yes, everything. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I think this is something that a lot of the people in our audience were interested in. So Holger, we're at the end of our time box. We end on time. Thank you so much for taking the time, doing this with us. I think you impressed, impressed a lot of people with your low tech approach to the presentation. Now you're gone. I don't know what happened, but, uh, let me thank you on behalf of everyone attending. It was great having you here with us.